how's it going, everyone? You're listening to episode 14 of the Rug Riders Podcast. We're the podcast for writers, by writers. We share our personal experiences from five very different backgrounds. This week, we're going back to our roots and talking about some hard-earned tips that we've learned uh, from mistakes we've made and things like that and the lessons that came uh, as a result. So hopefully you find that fun and interesting. I'm sitting here with four very talented writers here, so let's go ahead and meet everyone now. Okay, so two of the writers are brand new to the experience. That's Spencer and Jeremy, so it'll be interesting to see what they have to say in the podcast. For our intros today, we'll each state our name, what we do, and we'll talk about a trait that we have that is both a curse and a blessing and how it affects our writing. Okay, so this should be pretty interesting. So, Amy, do you mind starting us out? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy, and I'm a copywriter and SEO associate here. Um, And my trait is probably perfectionism. And um, I know, you know, I guess it helps me do a good job at my work because I'm always trying to get things perfect, although there is no such thing as perfection. Um, But it also um, prevents me from, I guess, I hold on to my work too long trying to get it perfect. And um, it also leads me to procrastinate if I can't figure out how to start something right away or I think... You know, I'm not going to be able to do this perfectly. I kind of, you know, stall on starting things. So um, I guess that would be mine. And and in that process, I also have to really quiet my (laughs) self-criticism to get things done. So it's weird how perfectionism works that way. You know, it can be an advantage to help you do things better, but then it can also, you know, slow you down. So Awesome, awesome. (laughs) Richard? Um, well, my trait is, is my Scandinavian stoicism. Um, <laughs> basically, it means I don't like, I'd rather eat dog shit than hear myself complain. <laughs> is basically what it comes down to. Now, that's an advantage, because I'm not always going around saying, you know what your problem is, you know what your problem is, and I think <laughs> I could probably get along better with people because of that. Sure. It's a disadvantage because I don't always tell people when something's wrong. I just kind of um, deal with it. it. Well, there's kind of, well, there's this, uh, there's this famous story about the, you know, the Spartans in ancient Greece where they were very stoic and they didn't complain and they raised their, their kids. And, and the kid on the way to school, the Spartan kid, he grabbed this wolf and he put him under his, his toga or whatever. Yeah. And, um, you know, they all play with him at lunch, recess or whatever. <laughs> and so he didn't want to complain and basically the wolf ate him to death while he was sitting in his seat because he didn't oh, complain. No. So not <laughs> complaining... Um, can have a downside. Sure. Um, you could get eaten to death. You can get eaten to death by a wolf, yes. Um, now, one thing the way it really affects my writing is I think a lot of things that bug me, um, I, I notice a lot of things I write um, on my blog are just traits of people that bug me that I don't <laughs> complain about, and oh. then I, I make a uh, make a... A poem about him, and I, I'm actually going to read an example. This is something I guess this one thing that annoys me is people who are really, you know, totally fastidious and they're annoyed by everything and they're total, total perfectionists. Sorry, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I wrote this about um, it's called Fastidious Fred. This is what I call a children's All poem. Right. Fastidious Fred makes his own bed, it takes him half an hour, and you can bet if he breaks a sweat, he always takes a shower. Everyone knows he irons his clothes until they look like new. It takes all day, he likes to say, but what's a guy to do? I demand perfection beyond detection and will not tolerate. Things deficient or insufficient are somehow second rate. He had a wife, the light of his life, but she didn't make the cut. He sent her away one rainy day when the door was improperly shut. It may sound cruel, but I need my rules. They bring order to my life. Discipline and a strict regimen protect me from chaos and strife. Fred lives alone in an immaculate home, and no one comes to see him. His house is clean and downright pristine, but no one wants to be him. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, nice poem about perfectionism. Spencer. <laughs> I'm Spencer. I'm a writer now here at Now Media. Um, and I think the, the trait I have that is both a curse and a blessing is I'm severely analytical. And in the positive way, it means I go out of my way, go the extra mile to make sure I do my research and make sure everything's backed up with um, concrete information. But I think how it can be negative is that I can make me too critical both on myself and on others. 
because I, I hold a high, very high standard for what I think um, research and writing needs to be at. So I, I might get something to a 95% perfection and then spend twice as much time trying to get that last 5% and, and end up just getting diminishing returns and, uh, and nothing gets done. I could have got two things or three things done <laughs> the time I could have tried to get this thing absolutely perfect. And also it means that it can restrict uh, what I think of other people's work, even though it's absolutely fantastic. So I think that's something I have to work on and uh, make sure to tailor it so it helps me and doesn't harm me. <laughs> that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Hi, guys. Uh, I'm Jeremy. I'm the social media manager here at Now Media Group. Um, a trait that I think uh, helps and hurts me um, is is my easygoing, relaxed, uh, kind of laid back personality. Um, I think that can um, help me in a work setting to become a kind of a valuable, reliable asset to a team. I'm not going to complain. I'm going to make uh, as little waves as possible. I'm just going to kind of go with the flow and, and, and be as helpful as I can. Um, in terms of writing, though, I think that laid-back personality can kind of uh, hurt me a little bit as I can just tend to wait till the last possible minute to start writing on things. And um, when that happens, you know, you're going to start writing under stress, and um, it kind of it takes a little bit of the enjoyment out of it when you feel like you're up against a deadline. So um, I think, yeah, I think that kind of easygoing personality can can. Uh, be to my detriment, just a smidge. <laughs> Interesting. All right, I'm Nick. I'm a SEO and freelance writer and copywriter here. And uh, I changed my answer because uh, I talked to my wife who knows me pretty well, and she said, for sure my trait that's a curse and a blessing is that I'm never content. So <clears throat> never being content has negatives and positives. Uh, as a negative... There's a lot of times where I should be just chilling at peace, and I'm rarely at peace. My mind's always racing, always th trying to think of what I should be doing, what I should be doing to improve. And but on the other side of the coin, that could also be a positive, because in, you know instead of being like, oh, I'm good, you know, I got to play video games or just do all these waste times. That like, no, I'm always trying to think of you know ways I should be improving and torturing myself if I'm not doing them. And that kind of thing. And so it's definitely a negative and a positive. And I think it affects my writing not in the obvious way to where, you know, I'm a perfectionist. Like you guys said, I really don't have that issue uh, in particular. But more so, I think it helps my writing in that every single time I go into it with the mindset that, hey, I'm going to make this the best thing I've ever done. And always trying to one-up myself. Always trying to just do better than last time. Uh, so that's mine uh that's uh never content all right so i got a question for you guys those are all cool responses and so got another question of a similar theme here and that's um what was a time in your life where you were both a hero and a villain so since my crazy question i'll go ahead and start us off it was uh both of these have to do with my grandma in this case he was uh just passed away earlier this year and um, she was well into her 80s, great woman, we had a good relationship. And anyway, one time I was the villain with my grandma, we would go shopping with my mom as a teenager, I think I was 16, and we were going shopping, whatever, my mom would just spend forever in these stores. So me and grandma are outside on the bench in Florida, and she's sitting there, and I'm fiddling with my mom's keychain that just has all kinds of stuff going on on it, and I hear Psh! And sure enough, I just blasted my grandma in the face with mace. <laughs> and uh, immediately there's a reaction, just immediately. As my grandma's sitting there, just perfect range, it was like, psh, psh, right into her face. And so she, she like reacts immediately, oh, oh. And then I'm like, I realize what had happened, so I'm tucking it into my back pocket real quick. Well, what happened, grandma? What happened? As I'm tucking the keychain in my back pocket, she's like, oh, I think a bug flew in my eye. I think a bug flew in my eye. So I'm like, oh, a bug, that's terrible. Like, I'm hugging my grandma at this point. I feel terrible. I didn't tell her for like 10 years, but <laughs> once I told her, we all had a good laugh about it. Oh, wow. But uh, that definitely happened. That was quite a quite an experience. So long before I got pepper sprayed, I pepper tested it out of my grandma. So... Uh, Time that, you know, not as, I want, you know, hero is a strong word, 
But uh, last time I was in Florida for uh, seven days, my grandma had already gotten into a car accident, broke both her legs. She was staying in this assisted living home. And even if the people I was with didn't want to, or my mom had other plans, I insisted every single day that we hang out of this place. We not only spent time with my grandma, which turned out was the last time I ever saw her, but also we made friends with some of the people there. And I mean, those people there who are just like in their, you know, not even that old in their 40s, but had some disease where they're on their way out and their parents are just shoveling money into this place. And just hearing the stories from all these people and just seeing people who are just genuinely lonely and in a bad spot is really an eye opener. It really makes you appreciate even the basic stuff that much more. So, oh, well, wasn't a hero. It was just a time where I chose to be selfless. And in this particular case, I was really glad I did. It was the last time I saw my grandma going every day to this uh, assisted living home to see her and spend time with her. So, uh, all right, Amy. Okay, yeah, that's right, like the hero. <laughs> I don't know if I was a hero in this situation, but um, at my previous job, it was similar to what I do here. I was a writer, and we had a really difficult client. She was a lawyer. We designed a site for her, and I wrote the content, and it was like nothing we did for her was right. She was really brutal with her criticism and, and things that she wanted done. So I ended up in a conference call with her, going through every line of the content I wrote, and she just ripped it apart. Oh, man. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, and she was already mad and, like, ready to leave us, but by the time we were done with that call, she was happy and we just moved on and she didn't leave so I don't know if I call myself a hero but at least I <laughs> kept the client I, yeah something. yeah but I really <laughs> really had to kind of take myself out of it and not take that criticism you know personally, personally too, yeah. in that situation because if I would have I wouldn't you know it would have probably gone differently but so um yeah that was the I guess, hero one. <laughs> a time I screwed up at that job also. Um, I was assigned part of a project to work on, and I don't know if I didn't just, I didn't hear the message that it was urgent, but that day I worked on something completely different and didn't get the project done. And by the end of the day, my manager's like, where is it? And I'm like, oh, no, I didn't know it was urgent or, you know. I don't know how I just kind of spaced that part of it. So then this client also was not happy, and then I didn't, you know, get that part of it done. So it was even later. So now from that, I kind of learned that um, find out what the expectations are on a project, especially if you're just assigned something out of the blue, you know, and that's how that one was. Like, at the beginning of the day, it was assigned to me, and yeah. So nice. that's good, kind good of Good lesson, I, too. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Exactly. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And apparently, you came from a really big place. Well, before. it was yeah, it was much bigger than here, but yeah. Here so, we're here we're small enough if any of our yeah. clients are listening. Well, we have really good communication, and we we you know we can say, hey Matt, yeah. right, what is this? Who needs it? When do we need it by? Right, right. Um, so we right. don't have that kind of giant shuffle where, yeah. and then we don't always you know who asked for this and and right and yeah, where I worked, it was like at the time at least it was a group of like thirty five or thirty writers, and then we had like a dozen project managers, so you're getting stuff from yeah. multiple places, and yeah. Absolutely. That can cause confusion. For sure. Yeah. Um, okay, I'll start with the villain. Um, back in before video cameras, when we had actual movie cameras, um, when I was a kid one time, um, my dad would just have me filming with a Super 8 camera, and um, and all my sisters, my cousin had brand new paper dresses. I was just a little kid, like five or six years old. They were all in the backyard having a wonderful time. And while my dad was filming, I decided it'd be a great idea to get the hose and squirt everybody. <laughs> ruining all, I don't know who bought them all these paper dresses, ruining all the paper dresses, being a giant. And my sister was like, you know, when we get out the film, oh, let's get the one where Richard destroyed all the paper dresses. <laughs> I don't even remember doing it, but I certainly, you know, remember that I, that was that was a family legend that I ruined up with the paper dresses. That's so awesome. Funny. Um, I feel like he, I was 26. Hero. <laughs> yeah, I was 40. Yeah. <laughs> he, the hero was, um, um, when I, I used to teach kids for, for uh, several years, and a lot of times kids would come back and they'd want to see you, they'd want to hang out with you, and that always felt good. I had plenty of time for colleagues or 
um, supervisors, administrators would say, hey, you did a really good job on the lesson, or hey, I like the way you handled that situation, or you were really helpful with this. But the thing that always really moved me the most when I was teaching would be when a parent would say, usually at the end of the year or during conference time, that I'd really made a difference in their child's life. Oh, the nice. family like you know talked about what we were talking about at school that day, and it was really a big part of their their family discourse. And so that, that's to cool. me, that was always the thing that made me feel really good when I was doing that job. Nice, that's cool. Um, all right, I guess I'll start with the villain. I remember. I, I like to think that I, there's not too many times I've been a villain, but <laughs> but I, <laughs> I remember what, back when Yahoo Answers was still big. Uh, I think I was in about fourth or fifth grade, and I just had all the time in the world, the computer at my hand. So <laughs> and so um, I would go on there and post really di- ridiculous things. And I remember one time I posted a question with something like, I, I got a puppy a couple of weeks ago, and I, I think it's starting to get hungry. <laughs> oh, what should I do? <laughs> and, and, I remember, and then like the, I, I refreshed the page within one minute. I got like 10 responses of like three paragraphs <laughs> each telling me how terrible I was. That's and I, hilarious. And, and like the next minute, I refreshed the page, and it got like taken down by the administrator. So uh-huh. that, <laughs> you rebel. Trolling. Trailblazer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, trolling on Yahoo Answers. Yeah. <laughs> and um. Funny, I say, like I said, I'm not sure if I would call myself a hero in this situation, but I remember one time um, I was at my parents' house and I, we got a call from my dad who was across town. Um, he was having a heart attack. So um, and that was really scary and we had to we had to go across town to try to get, get to him. And we got there just as the ambulance was about to, to um, leave. So I got to jump in the ambulance right um, as they were leaving and ride in it as they're going to the hospital. I had to take care of all like the, the medical questions and make sure everything was uh, going right, has all all his belongings and things like that. And that was um, it was a time I really had to step up, and it, it showed me that even the people I have like I, people I think I put on a pedestal, like my father, or I think who are heroes to me, that they are fallible and they are um, human, and they and they won't be here forever. So I think it showed me that it's important to take time to to be with those people and to learn from them. Um, yeah, that's that's part. Awesome. Yeah, so mine's a good amount more or less uh, inspiring <laughs> than that. <laughs> yeah, um, much more inspiring. <laughs> uh, so just recently, uh, in addition to being the uh, social media manager, I'm also the uh, the birthday special specialist. Um, so one of my jobs is I, when it's someone's birthday, I either get uh, their favorite pizza or their favorite cake, whatever they're interested in. Um, and uh, I figured I'd be smart a few weeks ago to uh, call Costco ahead of time and get the pizza started so uh, I could just get there, get back, and everyone can eat their pizza. Uh, and hopefully they'll like me for um, getting the pizza quickly. So I <laughs> go to the pizza place, or the Costco. I go to Costco, the Costco that I thought I called. And as it turns out, it's not the Costco that I called. So I ended up having to wait <laughs> about... 25 minutes for my pizza. Meanwhile, I'm getting messages of uh, the guy whose birthday it is saying that it's it's his worst birthday ever. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that, you know, I attempted to be a hero. I quickly became a villain. Um, and then I, I guess I redeemed myself eventually bringing the pizzas. Um, you brought a lot. Of, yeah. You brought a lot of pizza. And so I made up for it with... You brought a lot of yeah, pizza. I, I left over some Made up for it with the, the quantity over the uh, quality and for right. 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 Yeah. Right. so uh yeah pretty lame villain but it's like a terror experience <laughs> yeah <laughs> roller coaster of i was pretty hungry day. Yeah, yeah. it's like one of those in south park when uh butters becomes uh captain chaos or whatever yeah. like, i'm gonna cause chaos and he does like really minor stuff to be a villain because <laughs> yeah. of those last two uh, yeah. awesome so you know, I completed your segment yeah right? pretty much. all right cool <laughs> All right, so for the featured segment this time, I have it. It's my turn. I'm going to do a motivating passage from one of my favorite books and authors, uh, The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. He's a member of the Mexican Toltec tribe, which basically is their, you know, they, all their philosophers and their wise people go and become parts of their uh, Toltec tribe, and they pass down wisdom over generations. So... Four agreements are phenomenal. The four agreements are be impeccable with your word. Don't take anything personally. Don't make assumptions and always do your best. So I'm going to read a page here from the section on not taking things personally. 
And I feel like it's motivating because motivation isn't just about positive pep talks, but it's also about learning how to handle negatives that can take away your motivation. So passage goes like this. Even when a situation seems so personal, even if others insult you directly, it has nothing to do with you. What they say, what they do, and the opinions they give are according to the agreements they have in their own minds. Their point of view comes from all the programming they received while they're being domesticated. If someone gives you an opinion and says, hey, look, you look so fat, don't take it personally because the truth is this person's dealing with his or her own feelings, beliefs, and opinions. That person tried to send poison to you. And if you choose to take it personally, then you take that poison and it becomes yours. Taking things personally makes you easy prey for these predators, these black magicians. They can hook you easily with one little opinion and feed you whatever poison they want. And it's all because that you choose to take it personally and eat it up. You eat all their emotional garbage and then it becomes your garbage. But if you don't take it personally, you become immune to the middle of hell. So I like that. I like that passage. And I really love that metaphor that whenever somebody puts negativity in front of you, whether it's being condescending, directly criticizing you, whatever the case uh, assuming it doesn't have truth to it, which sometimes <laughs> criticism does. And uh, I really like that metaphor of, hey, it's poison. And you can choose to just let it lay and never think about it again. Or you can choose to obsess over it until it really becomes a part of your psyche and drops your self-esteem and things like that. Because I, awesome. so I found that to be really motivating. It did piggyback off what you said about taking things personally. Yeah, so, definitely. Yeah. Nice. All right, so that leads us to our main discussion, which is tips and mistakes from our personal experience. All right, so we all prepared stuff for uh, this. We've all been writing a long time. We've made a lot of mistakes and have some lessons for it to talk about. So you want to start us off, Amy? Sure, and it's perfect because my first <laughs> my first point is to not take criticism personally. Awesome. Um, uh, yeah, don't take it personally. Get your ego out of it, and everyone needs an editor. So I, I know I used to take things too personally, I took them too hard, and I'd let it get to me, just like that, you know, passage was saying. Um, and I w couldn't take feedback in a constructive way for a really long time. It took me a long time to learn that. And I realized at some point that not being able to take it um, as constructive feedback was preventing me from growing in my writing and just in life in general. So I think when you get criticism, you have to consider the source. Do they know what they're talking about, you know, related to your writing or whatever they're, you know, giving you feedback on? If they do, take that feedback and learn from it. Don't take it personally. If they don't know what they're talking about, <laughs> which, you know, happens a online a lot, <laughs> especially, um, just let it go and, and move on. Don't, you know, like internalize it and take it all in <laughs> like that. Um, but definitely if you hear the same critique over and over again, it's probably something you need to consider, um, you know, looking at and, and working on. So my other point is, um, if you have the time when you're working on your writing to let it sit for a while, I think that was a really big thing I realized too, that I can keep working on it and working on it and working on it, but I keep, I keep either overlooking the same mistakes because I you know, been reading the same thing for too long, and it helps to just, like, let it sit and come back to it with fresh eyes, whether that's, like, a few minutes or a few days. Um, and if you don't have time to do that, try to get some feedback from somebody else who might see things that you're not seeing. Um, and then also, you know, I kind of spoke about this before, but don't hold on to your writing forever. There's no such thing as perfection. <laughs> <laughs> um, so at some point, you just have to hand it in, set it to to the editor, get feedback on it. Um, and then the last thing is to be flexible and adaptable. So you can't get too stuck in your style of writing or your ways of writing um, because you can't change and grow that way. Because everybody's always learning and improving, um, even if you're an, like a, an accomplished novelist. You still need to take feedback and be able to adapt and grow. Um, so yeah, I, I've talked about my previous job, which was similar to this one, and that you know I left that job like before my son was born, so it was almost at least six years ago now. 
So a lot of things have changed as far as SEO, so I've had to kind of adapt that way. Things that I were like set in stone back then are not how you do it now, so I've had to kind of, yeah, rework how I do things and, and what I, you know, what are supposed to be SEO strategies. Um, and even like here we use the Oxford comma, which I've never used before, and that is really hard for me to get it to remember to use that. So I mean, things like that, you just have to be able to adapt and, and change. So you bring up uh, taking things personally, but what? Yes. So what happens okay. when you keep getting continuous feedback, say you know often or repeatedly, mm -hmm. and you don't think the person knows is <laughs> in the right place to tell you? Like how do you how do you deal with that? Like if you keep getting the feedback, yeah. maybe from a peer yeah. or even even a supervisor, I guess, but you just wholeheartedly disagree with it based on your knowledge. Yeah, I, I guess first, if I keep getting the same feedback, I'd have to look at it and say, am I really right here? You know, am yeah. I missing something? And maybe have someone else look at it and say, hey, I'm getting this feedback, you know, all the time. What do you think? You know, just getting other opinions too. Oh, that's a good um, idea. But I guess at some point, yeah, you know. We have to see if it's actually, <laughs> everybody is different. And writing is, you know, what, what is right in writing to one person is going to be different to another person. Very there are true. the rules, and those are, you know, generally accepted rules to writing. But, you know, there are times that you can break those rules, and it's powerful. And whether you, <laughs> you know, yeah, so it's really, it's subjective. I guess so. It's that's difficult. Yeah. But definitely, if you keep hearing the same thing over and over again, if, especially if you hear it from multiple sources, yeah, then, then it's yeah, worth looking. Then you're at like, sure. okay, do I really? Is this really, you know, correct? Or yeah. is there something not? Am I thinking that I'm doing it right or breaking the rules? You know, in a way that makes it stronger. Or, you know, am I missing something here? So. That's a good point. And, and here we have certain conventions which we all kind mm -hmm. of. And here too, I mean, simple things like is, instead of saying the word mouth or teeth, we say smile because it's much more appealing to say smile. Yeah. Um, but sometimes you have to say teeth. You can't always say smile. Sure. You know, you're straightening your teeth, not your smile. Yeah. And so they're little things. But yeah, I mean, sometimes when I have uh, uh, you, people uh, make. Uh, you know, suggestions. suggestions. Yeah. You know, um, I, you know, I've read a lot of books about writing, and I can say, well, this is not what you know Stephen Pinker says. You know, who's on two library boards? Or I can say this is not what the great David Ogilvy says. Uh, or yeah. so mm -hmm. you can certainly appeal to people, but yeah, there's definitely different ideas about what. There's no ultimately set rules on certain types of things. There is, as you mentioned, the Oxford comma, mm -hmm. which I'm not crazy about either. But that is that That's is the convention. Yeah, yeah, all the all the all the. People are being taught that now in schools. Um, people yeah. who are a little older grew up without it, and and think I think it flows better without it. But it is the accepted convention, and there is actually um, some there's considerable evidence that uh, one of the ways Google Google knows bad writing, um, and if you if writing with just bad grammar and and breaking the rules, and you yeah. and your ranking will get lowered. If you have just re, you know bad spelling, bad grammar, the basic kind of stuff, Google does know that we yeah. uh, we don't we Quality don't know contents, the we, top thing yeah. we, we don't yeah. know how much. I mean, it's amazing how Google finds things and ranks things, and we it's a big yeah, giant mystery. But we do know that just outright bad grammar, yeah. you know, and and miss really bad egregious miscommas that that will get your your writing lower. Very true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So your uh, tips and mistakes. Then? Okay, um, number one, make the tone appropriate for the subject and the audience. Um, the subject, what you're writing about, and the audience. Um, for a classic example, of course, like sarcasm and verbal irony. Um, if you, uh, you know, if you're writing an engineering a paper, you're an engineer, and you said the bridge was structurally unsound and it collapsed and everyone died. Wasn't that fantastic? Uh, <laughs> of course, you're not going to say that. If you're writing for your audience as well, you know, if you're writing for like small children, they don't get verbal irony and sarcasm. They have no idea what you're talking about. Now, if you're a columnist. Who, 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 you know, is a humorist and everybody knows you're going, you write a certain way. If you're like John Carroll or, or somebody who writes a certain style, then people expect humor. They expect sarcasm. But, and, you know, they expect it maybe more in a novel than they would in a dental implant site, you know? <laughs> um, so you, so your tone needs to match 
your audience and your subject is really important. Nice. Um, number two, you do your research and have it with you. You never know what you're going to need. The more research you do, the easier it is going to be once you have to start writing. The worst thing is you're right in the middle of writing something and there's a certain part of it you don't know about and you got to stop cold in the middle and go back and do research. You lose all your rhythm, all your momentum. And the more you read, the better off you're going to be. There's a, speaking of the great legendary David Ogilvy, um, there's a classic, he said he, he'd bring home um, two hours of reading every night, which his wife didn't appreciate at all. <laughs> and um, But he said you never know. And one of his famous uh, headlines he wrote when he was uh, probably back in the 50s or 60s for, for um, Rolls Royce, he said that it's so quiet that the loudest thing you're going to hear is the electric clock on the dashboard. And that was back, of course, when the electric car, it wasn't digital. That was an actual clock on the dashboard. And fancy cars had, had clocks that were not digital. Um, they were no old-fashioned clocks. Now, where did he get that? Actually, one of the engineers actually said that. That was a quote he took directly from one of the engineers. That was from okay. hours and hours of reading and research where he got that quote. He didn't, maybe at the moment he read it, he didn't know, aha, that's it. Yeah. But it did. That was it. As he was going back over all his research and what can what can be my hook to get people, and so but that's a very powerful point. It's so quiet. The clock, your, your engine is so quiet, so smooth. The loudest thing in the cabin is the clock. So nice. the the more research you do, the, the better off you are. Um, so. it, 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 okay, number three. Try. One of my rules is just brevity. Try to say things in the fewest words possible. You know, there are a lot of great novels like Henry James and William Faulkner have just the opposite um, attitude and just uh, overpower you with words. Yeah. Um, and that can be very effective, too, but not in the kind of work we do. Yeah. And generally speaking, I prefer writers who say things with fewest words, yeah. the, what they call the nominalist. Um and, uh, you know, one thing I, I, I wrote an article once about Emily Dickinson saying, you know, in the meaning per syllable metric, she she can say so much with so few syllables, it's really impressive. And that actually brings to me to my fourth point, which is um, read widely, read different types, read poetry, read read nonfiction, read fiction, and, and you'll learn so much without even realizing you're learning it. Through the alchemy in your brain, you'll start using a sentence construction. Where did I get that? You'll never know exactly where you... Who did I steal this from? I don't know, because I read so much. And I really recommend like reading stuff that's in all sorts of... A subject matter so that you might not even be interested. You know, there's a there's a site you can go to called Arts and Letters Daily, and it's just A L Daily, Al Daily dot yeah, com. Real easy. And you can every magazine, um, even if they have a paywall, just about every magazine except for Harper's, <laughs> they put like one article that's not in the paywall. But most are most magazines will put three or four articles out there for you to read because they will, you know, give them your sample. And if you like it, they figure you'll 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 pay to get behind the paywall. Sure. And also, if they like break a big story, a lot of times they won't put it behind the paywall because it's getting so much so much interest. Um, and you know, if you go on there, if you you know, there's there's certain you know the Baffler. The New Republic, The New Yorker, The London Review of Books, The New York Review of Books. If I go to one of those sites, I'll know that even if the person's a specialist, they'll understand that I'm not a specialist. It's okay. like, if, you know, if you went to like a physics journal, you wouldn't understand a word of it. But if a physicist wrote an article for one of these magazines, yeah. they'd write it for laymen. That's so what I, I, what I like to do is read something by somebody who's really smart, but they know that they're not writing for a specialist. Yeah. And so you, you, you learn a lot that way. Um, a few years ago, I read a really good book called The Spectacle of Skill. Um, I read an excerpt of it uh, in one of our earlier writers by um, Robert Hughes. Now, Robert Hughes is an art historian. I don't know a lot about art, um, visual art, yeah. but I love writing because he's a great artist. He has all kinds of interesting things to say. And and it, what happened was he actually was writing a memoir, and right in the middle of writing his memoir, he died. Oh, and so he had like half hey, a memoir. Happens. And so what the publisher did was they took half of his memoir, and then they just took some of his greatest hits, you know, and put them together and packaged sure. it as a book called <laughs> The Spectacle of Skill. Nice. And um, like there was, he loved fishing. Now, I have no interest in fishing. I never. I've been fishing. I never want to do it again. Sure, it sure. doesn't throw me at all. Um, but reading his articles on fishing are really interesting. I learn a lot. And so reading about things that you're not even necessarily interested. Yeah. If it's a good writer, you're going to learn a lot. That's um, a good point. Yeah. Okay, I'll pass it on. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I just I when I was talking with uh, Jonathan, um, is it on the podcast? Uh, he. One of the first conversations I had with him was saying that 
the goal of, of a lot of writing and the writing what we do here is to be authentic, positive, and compelling. And I thought, man, that sounds really good. And, and I, I <laughs> yeah, get that. I'm going to do that. Mm-hmm. And um, but the thing is, I knew it, but I didn't understand it. And it took me making up making mistakes for me to really fully uh, grasp what that actually means. And like for being authentic, um, I found myself occasionally using some really cheesy line that you know maybe sounds good in my head, but once um, it's read, it sounds terrible and it comes <laughs> off as really salesy. It's something like, "We know you have a great smile." Well, if someone is going to a, a, a dental website, they know they don't have a great smile. They want a great smile, but they don't have it. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's important to, to not be deceitful to people and to inspire them to say, like, we believe everyone has potential for a great smile. We want to make that possible for you. Um, does that actually spark something in people rather than trying to try to appeal to them on a very surface level? And the other part of it is uh, being positive and you can. Uh, I think it's very easy to go down the road of trying to use uh, fear as a motivator for people. Yeah. If, say, if you want to get, um, you're trying to promote uh, oral cancer screenings, and it, you you could say, you know, you, you know, 35 people, uh, 35, 35 million people a year die from cancer, mm-hmm. and uh, if you don't want to die, you should get your oral cancer screening. That's what I always do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I leave and, a stat about how and, horrible it is. And that doesn't, um, it doesn't actually work. If you actually look, look at research done on like anti-smoking ads, they're not effective. Most of them aren't effective. And a, a better way to do it is try to come off as positive saying, you know, uh, cancer or cancer in its early stages is very treatable. It only takes a couple of minutes to get screened, right. um, schedule your appointment today. Um, it, it's important to come off as positive and um, use use also the connotation. Like if you're talking about how something's really um, makes a big change, you could use something like drastically. Except for drastically has a bad uh, the negative connotation with it. Yeah. So you could use something in like dramatically instead. So it's important to. When you're writing, to also look at what do these words mean um, and their individual parts and what are the connotations people think of when they think of the words. And um, the last part is to make sure to be compelling when you're writing. And you can have like a – you can have a work. You can said you can have a physicist who has um, – who knows everything about this certain topic. And he can give you every single detail you would ever need to know about this topic. And then you could read all of it. And you have no idea what any of it says. <laughs> and you really don't care because it, it's, it doesn't appeal to you. It's important to, you said, know who you're writing to, but also write things in a way that is uh, telling a story and is uh, emotional. And so you can connect with the, your reader. And your reader, you're not going to win people over by having all the, great, the greatest facts in the world. You're going to win them over by winning their hearts. So you got to appeal to their emotions as, as well as um, their intellect. So I think that's... Uh, those are the three things I, I really think are important in writing is to make sure to stay positive, be authentic, and be compelling. Good point. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, one of my tips would be um, to do everything you can not to let your ideas get away from you. I think a lot of times when you're trying to kind of mentally compose an article or a piece in your head and you're talking about writing this here, this here, um, that's a great way to forget some pieces of information. Um, so I would just, anytime you have an idea, either in your head or you see online, um, when you're trying to sit down and write a post, write it down, uh, somewhere just so you don't forget it. Um, I think, I think trying to construct the entire essay in your head before you start writing can prove to be a a faulty strategy for some people. Um, another thing would be, uh, if you're struggling with writer's block, um, and you're getting frustrated about not knowing what to write about, I think you know, procrastinating can be either constructive or detrimental to, what you're, to, to, your, to your writing. If you're going to go for a walk and kind of dwell on what you're thinking about, that's, that's constructive procrastinating, and then come back to it. If you're frustrated about not knowing what to write about, and you just be like, oh, I'll come back to that, and then you go watch TV or just try to forget about it, you're probably not going to have too many more ideas um, when you come back and try to write, or you're just playing on your phone. Um, <laughs> so, so I think, yeah, I think if you do something to get your your brain running, um, that that can help you a good amount when it comes to uh, writing. And then one other tip that I thought was interesting was um, when you're doing research for an article. I've done this before, where I see uh, another article that is like 
totally talking about what I want to talk about in an article, my article. And I'm like, awesome. Uh, let me take some of what they're saying and put it in my article, and it'll be cool. I'll have, I'll have a good uh, reference. Um, but what I've found that I, I do sometimes is I kind of take the whole article, reword it, and and it just doesn't come off as very authentic on my part. Um, so I think I think it's uh, obviously you want as many references and and um, and good pieces of information as possible, but to take too much of of some other some other person's work uh, can prove to be um, not the best strategy. So. Awesome. All right. So. Uh... I have four different uh, tips I've learned over my years of writing before I started working here as a freelance writer for six years and made a living that way and stuff. So I had a lot of mistakes for sure. Uh, and I learned from some of them. So my first thing is that uh, it's always best to be vulnerable. And this is hard for a lot of people. It's hard for uh, those times in my life, like for instance, being in the Navy surrounded by Every dude's trying to be 20% tougher than he is and that kind of thing. So there's times in your life where you may feel pressured to be, you know, push a certain trait forward or whatever the case. But I think ultimately the best way to be both in life and in writing, it definitely seeps into your writing, is to be as vulnerable as you possibly can. And, yeah, not having an emotional guard up does set you up to, you know, get hurt by dumb things or emotionally disappointed or hurt. Uh, in various situations, but I think ultimately it's the best and it shines through in your writing. If somebody's writing, they're very guarded, they're very, you know, by the book or whatever, and then it's going to be, it's going to be mediocre, just like the mindset's mediocre. So I think being vulnerable is crucial to excellent writing. Secondly, just like the uh, desktop wallpaper I have at home, it says, have an appetite for risk. And I honestly can't stress this enough, but even little things in your life, like say you see a group of girls sitting at a table when you're in line at the cafe, like what do you really have to lose from walking up, taking that risk, introducing yourself, or making fun conversation? You really have little to lose and a lot to gain. And it's not until you do things that defy your own comfort zone or your own fear that you realize that there's another side. Until then, like if you never once do anything like that, you'll live your entire life, and we all know people like this, people, you know, who've never really broken any of their walls of their comfort zone so i think all the time as much as possible do little things to uh uh take risks and get out of your comfort zone because that definitely shines through in your writing um and then uh also if you're serious about being a writer write often not casually okay for me i mean i always consider myself a writer since i was a teen i have no books full of notes philosophies martial arts stuff ideas whatever but uh, it wasn't until I was writing to make a living at it when I was getting my MBA that I really took it seriously. When I was looking for, uh, you know, actual writing gigs, and if they didn't pay at least 50 bucks per blog, and I wasn't even talking to them, that's when I started really taking it seriously. So I would say once you flip that switch, and you're like, screw, screw everything else, I'm a writer. And you uh, are doing it often, all the time. It really, uh, really kicks yourself into fifth gear. It kicks your writing career into fifth gear. And one quote, uh, a guy in the Navy who was, I definitely was my mentor. He was a Wing Chun expert. He taught it on the ship. He was a black dude, Moses Anderson. All the time he used to say, everybody wants to be Bruce Lee, but they don't want to put in the Bruce Lee hours. And that definitely applies to writing. Everybody wants to be the next Stephen King or J.K. Rowling who come up regularly on the podcast. But unless you're willing to go through that grind of writing day in, day out, all those days you're not getting recognized, then uh, you're never going to get to that level. So finally, um, there's one that is a mistake everyone makes because you simply, I don't know, rare. it's rare for people to immediately go into life knowing what their strengths are. But I definitely think follow your strengths is a crucial piece of advice. Like if you know that writing is always a struggle for you, then look, even if you love it, maybe look to something else just realistically, unless you're planning to put in the hours to work on it. Uh, cause for me, I mean, I've definitely had jobs where I was one of the mediocre ones. I was not loving the work. I was not great at the work. Even being in the Navy, it was always the gearhead guys who grew up fixing cars that were way better at it than me. 
uh, tr troubleshooting the Aegis radar and stuff. And it really wasn't until this job and this kind of job where I excelled because I love the work. I love writing, always have, and I'm pretty good at it. So I've been doing it for years before this. So it all just came into place. So I would say definitely know your strengths and try to follow them. Um, so to recap, have an appetite for risk, be vulnerable, write often, not casually, and uh, follow your strengths are my pieces of advice. So, Amy, you have some discussion questions? Yes, I do. Awesome. So, um, we're all professional writers now, um, but think back to the time when you were just start, starting to write or studying writing, and is there some, like, the main thing that you've realized or learned in that process that's different from when, you know, from now when you're a professional writer to when you were just studying? Because for me, one of the biggest differences is um, you know, I studied journalism in college, and this will probably date me, but when I studied journalism, we didn't even discuss anything online. Like, that just wasn't a thing. I had an older teacher, so I think all of his experience came from print journalism, and actually a lot of magazines and newspapers weren't even online yet then. Interesting. So, <laughs> um, so I, and then, so that was like the background that I got. Everything was like, you know, typed up and it was formatted for being printed in a newspaper. Uh -huh. um, so I think that's like the biggest thing that there's not just one way to do things. You have to be able to adapt and be flexible, like I said before. And, you know, even though what I learned in journalism, I can apply some of it. A lot of it was really useless when I, <laughs> when I actually, I, I worked briefly as a newspaper reporter, but even then it was like, the focus was moving more on their website and things. So gotcha. um, I definitely had to relearn things and do things differently based on that. So I think that's like one of the biggest things for me based on like when I was studying it to when I actually use it in real life. So Interesting. do you guys like have something that's kind of stood out for you, like something that's changed or something that you've had to like learn for me for sure uh yeah great that's a great question for me for sure learning about seo and getting deep now into seo made a big difference because it brought up the point that was just always the elephant in the room when you're reading stuff whether it's online or anywhere else that hey look how this looks on the page does matter you know how how your writing looks on the page it matters I mean, you could be reading about, you know, the, the meaning of life, direct, you know, anything. It's super interesting. But if it's crammed together in a page with no spacing, no headings, and just a nonstop 20-line paragraph, I mean, people are going to tune out after, like, three lines of that. Mm -hmm. So SEO, for me, really, in addition to, you know, being my profession now, really helps my writing, I feel like, just having that knowledge that, okay, you know, your, what you're saying is good, your content's good, but how does it look on the page? How readable mm -hmm. is it? Because I guarantee that uh, makes a big difference. I know people who never pick up a book, so if it's jammed together like that, there's no way they're going to even read it. So I try to make things easily readable for the lowest common denominator who rarely reads even. And uh, I think that's important in all facets, also considering how easy your stuff is to read in addition mm -hmm. to how high quality it is. Going off that, I think um, one of the biggest things I didn't I didn't understand at first is that you need to make content that is not only appealing to read on desktop format but also on mobile. Oh, good um, And you can't and you can't just go for mobile either. You can't just design a page that looks good on mobile because yeah. there is still even though mobile is growing, there is still a significant amount of desktop as well. So you need to make content that looks good on both platforms. And um, oftentimes you can write it, and it really, it literally just takes looking at it on the mobile on desktop. You can, after it's written, and say, what, how, does this, "How does this look? All right, this looks like two or three lines too too long. I need to split this up here, change this here, and maybe this header looks great on a uh, desktop format." And like, oh man, it's a great header. But then suddenly, when it's on mobile, it's three or four lines yeah. of a header. <laughs> <laughs> and th so, I think that's what I learned a lot is that it, it takes a lot more time to make sure it's done right, but it's super worth it. You're going to get way more um, people looking at it, more engagement, and less um, less bounce uh, people bouncing off the page. Bounce rate. Bounce rate if, um, if it actually is compelling enough to look both good on both platforms. That makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, uh, kind of going off what Nick and Spencer said, um, 
you know, you might write something and think it sounds really good, either the title or the description or the, the article itself. Um, you know, if you want as many eyes on it as possible, it, it kind of doesn't matter as much if, if you think it sounds good. If you want people to see, you have to please Google. Yeah. And you have, to, you have to get Google to like what you're saying. So mm-hmm. you might have to word it to make it as, uh, as friendly to Google as possible. So mm-hmm. it's just kind of interesting. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, yeah that's, to that. that's really important is just the format and how, you know, make it in small bites. Yeah, yeah um, so that's a good way can, to describe it. So people can, won't be intimidated. That's what, that's what, even um, uh, Joseph Sugarman, who was writing about uh, basically uh, infomercials, it, like uh, copy in a magazine, yeah. even, even then, um, but with print, you know, he said, you know, if too much is, you, you want to invite the reader in. So you want to, and you want your words to have a certain flow. Yeah, and so you want sense. headlines. And there's even research that shows that headlines, even if they have nothing to do with the content, yeah. people are more likely to read it. Um, just because it, it's less intimidating than just a wall of text. Oh, yeah. And, mm-hmm. and, I agree. And there's definitely different ways. You know, you, you want to write with, with shorter, more direct sentences, yeah. not long, and shorter paragraphs, and especially as we get more and more to mobile because, one, you know, if it just goes on and on and on without a break on their phone, it's yeah. like it, it's, it's, it's not it's digestible. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Even last week, I remember I was looking, and I was like, oh, finally, this would be a great source for what I was looking for, you know, smoking and gum disease or whatever it was. And uh, it was a really credible doctor or whatever, and the entire study was just like zero, you know, zero spacing, zero, like nonstop co- wall of content. The entire page, scroll down, it continues on. It's like, holy crap, I'm not reading this, and immediately it's just a bad link, and there's no way I'm linking to that. I'm just not doing it, so... It's really interesting how you know how it looks does matter, you know. Mm-hmm, definitely. Okay. Um, so my other question is, when you do make a mistake, how do you deal with it? You know, some people will come up with excuses right away, or um, you know, fight back. Um, so how how do you, te- you typically deal with that? Like, go straight you know, for the excuses. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Many like, people to blame as possible. Yeah. Aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I found I found that it's something I've learned not just through writing but through working in general is whenever you hit a problem address it immediately mm-hmm. don't let any yeah. time go by it's, <laughs> but of course sometimes you have to take care of things but as, me, as soon as you can take care of it take care of it let people know who need to know and solve the problem and also when you're telling a problem don't just say oh here's this problem hi boss here's this problem good luck with that oh, yeah. <laughs> say yeah. here's this problem and here's a how I'm going to solve it Right, yeah. having, having an idea. idea of how to move forward next time. Yeah, because usually it's yeah. not, it, um, even if you think it's catastrophic, it's probably not catastrophic. You're not the first person that make that mistake. Right. You know, how, there's probably an, a fairly easy solution, and even if it's, it's bad, you can make it much better if you can have a solution for it and have someone help you out rather than try to hide it for as long as possible. So right. I think address it as soon as you can. I think that's the biggest thing I've learned about problems. Yeah. Yeah, and and I was kidding. You really need to own it. Um, yeah. You know, you don't use a passive construction. You know, like kids, you know, you, you hear a crash in the room, you walk in the room, and the kid's like, lamp got broken. You know? <laughs> yeah. So I, I did this, I screwed up, what do I do now is usually the best. And people appreciate that mm-hmm. when you don't point your fingers or you don't say, Absolutely. Yeah. man, I think, I, you know, I, I remember saying to Jonathan, I think I stuck my foot in my mouth on this one, what do I do? <laughs> you know, so... Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. You want to own it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think, um, you know, when I make a mistake as, as being kind of a, such a novice compared to some of the other writers in this room, like, I'm all about taking, you know, that, that criticism and hopefully constructive criticism, but um, just any advice I can take when I make a mistake, I welcome it. Um, there's a quote in a movie, um, Whiplash, the uh, J.K. Simmons character says, uh, there are no two words more harmful in the English language than good job. And I think that's really relevant wow, to me as, really? as, a, as a writer. Just like, <laughs> that's the last thing I want to hear. If, 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 you never want to hear good job? No, I, 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 want, to, I want to know. Maybe when I was in school, that's yeah. what I'd want to hear. Like, I oh, don't tell me anything. Just you know, leave me alone. <laughs> but now it's like, Please, please give me advice so I can yeah. get better. Uh, you know that because that's why I'm. Oh, uh, I see. You don't want them just complimenting you to be polite. Yeah, yeah. Please give me something advice. to work on. Or no, yeah, yes. nothing you can work with. Like, yeah. Good job. Okay, what's good about it? Yeah. So I can, yeah. Know I can do more of that. Exactly. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Come back to saying, oh, sorry. Oh no. <laughs> I say that no, no uh, writing is perfect. There's always right. something to improve yeah. upon. Yeah. So if someone that's says true. it, it, oh, this is good. We're like, okay, well, there's something I could change. <laughs> yeah. 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 
I was yeah. editing some of Spencer's work last week, and there was at least one where I didn't find a mistake. And I mean, yeah, it's like a rewrite for a page, uh, whatever. But I'm like, I mean, like, there's no mistake. There's no mistake. It's good, man. So yeah, it's that'll be like really a job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And you take feedback well too. Yeah, so that's that's always good. Good yeah. job taking it. <laughs> <laughs> good job. That's right. <laughs> yeah, for nice. me, I've really had to just be okay to know that it's okay to like learn from my mistakes, like you know, and move on and and incorporate that and do better next time. So yeah, awesome, definitely. All right, quotes. Yep, wow, quotes. They're already okay. All great. Right. Um, okay, I'm going to read a poem by Thomas Hardy. Um, Generally, people think of Thomas Hardy as a novelist. He wrote Far From the Madding Crowd, Tess of the Dubervilles, The Mayor of Casterbridge, very famous and very successful novelist. He also wrote volumes and volumes of poetry, um, Dylan Thomas. Um, I, and actually, a lot of my interest in Thomas Hardy is um, there's a, several re- recordings of readings done by Dylan Thomas that you can get to, like, 11 CDs. And he said that he really thinks... Uh, uh, Hardy is a very great poet indeed, was his word. He said, well, you, you just got to read all of his poetry, and there's a lot of really good stuff in there. Okay, so I'm going to read a very, very sad poem oh, called yeah. Neutral Tone. Going dark. Real dark. <laughs> we stood by a pond that winter day, and the sun was white as though chidden of God, and a few leaves lay on the starving sod. They had fallen from an ash, and were gray. Your eyes on me were as eyes that rove over tedious riddles of years ago, and some words play between us to and fro, on which lost the more by our love. The smile on your mouth was the deadest thing, alive enough to have strength to die. And a grin of bitterness swept thereby, like an ominous bird a wing. Since then, Keen lessons that love deceives, and rings with wrong have shaped to me your face and the god cursed sun and a tree and a pond edged with grayish leaves. Wow, like that. Okay, we're still going. <coughs> sure, direction. sure. Yeah, go ahead, Spencer. Sure, I, I, a small passage from a book called The Shack um, by William Paul Young. Um, it is a conversation uh, having an starts with, a uh, remember that choosing to stay on the ground is a choice to facilitate a relationship, to honor it. You do, uh, you do this yourself. You don't play a game or color a picture with a child to show your superiority. Rather, you choose to limit yourself so as to facilitate and honor that relationship. You'll even lose a competition to accomplish love. It is not about winning and losing, but about love and respect. Nice. I like that. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Very cool. Um, Mine is uh, much shorter, and I'm not even sure if it's actually from a book, but it's, it's <laughs> from... Uh, I just made it off. I'm it's done. from uh, Ernest Hemingway, and I'm not sure if it's from any of his works or not, but he says, um, There is nothing noble in being superior to your fellow man. True nobility is being superior to your former self. Mm-hmm. And I think that is kind of powerful um, uh, in terms of when you, you know, lay your head on the pillow at night and you kind of reflect back on your day. And you think about, like, did I improve anywhere on myself today? Did I do anything, like, productive or or anything that's going to help me be a better person? Help me get closer to the strongest version of myself. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, sometimes it's kind of hard to have that kind of reflection at the end of the day. But I think it would be kind of uh, important to do more times than not. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, one time I heard a quote in a movie, and I liked it so much <laughs> and that I read the whole book <laughs> looking for it. And it wasn't there. <laughs> and my copy was so much better than the book. It was one of those Whoa. rare cases yeah. where... I have to know um, what it is now. Well, the movie was called um, uh, Slaves of New York. And it was okay. about all these people in New York who wanted to be artists. And um, The sequel to Gangs of New York? Not <laughs> in the slightest. It was several years earlier okay. um, with Bernadette Peters. Actually, I think Steve Buscemi's first movie got this little cameo right at the oh, end. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but um, and there's this there's this line and it, it's all these women who are kind of like girlfriends with these artists and they'll live with these artists for a while and then the artists will kick them out and how they're kind of like slaves and how everybody is just so into this art scene <laughs> and um, 
and how like the the women are like not very loyal to each other um, and there's a lot of misogyny and 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 how the misogyny is not just men towards women but there's a lot of misogyny between the women how they like put each oh, other down really. and this one character she says you know what's wrong with this town is that the men hate the women and the women hate the women <laughs> and um and yeah, and I read the whole book, and which was not nearly as good as the movie, and I never found the line. Uh, and I'm man. like, okay, well, that was interesting. Moral of the story, don't read books. Don't read books. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. All right, so this quote is from uh, one of my favorite books, The Daily Stoic, from one of my favorite people who writes, Marcus Aurelius. And the point of it uh, in this section is called, uh, Our Well-Being Lies in Our Actions. So it's not too long. Those obsessed with glory attach their well-being to the regard of others. Those who love pleasure tie it to feelings. But the one with true understanding seeks it only in their own actions. Think on the character of the people one wishes to please, the possessions one wishes to gain, and the tactics one employs to such ends. How quickly time erases such things, and how many will yet be wiped away. (laughs) <laughs> okay, so my quote comes from the Data Ching, which is a classic uh, Chinese philosophical text. <clears throat> and I think this applies, it, it's on, based on flexibility, chapter 76. And I think this applies whether we're talking about being flexible in your physical body, um, in your writing, or just in life in general. So it goes... A man is born gentle and weak. At his death, he is hard and stiff. When alive, green plants are soft and supple. At their death, they are withered and dry. Therefore, the stiff and unbending are the companions of death. The gentle and yielding are the companions of life. Thus, an army without flexibility never never wins a battle. A tree that is unbending is easily broken. The hard and stiff or inflexible will be broken the soft and supple or flexible will prevail. Nice. Very cool. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, this out. yeah, this is it. So thank you so much for tuning in to the Road Riders podcast. Check back weekly for new episodes and keep up with everything Road Riders at nowmediagroup.tv slash rogue dash writers. You can check out more from Richard at laughterhopesockintheeye.com and find some amazing interviews from Nick on the Boo Foods Facebook page. We'd love it if you connected with us at our email address, roguewritersd at gmail.com. Thank you to Dirty Rose Productions for the intro and outro music, and a big thank you for tuning in today. We hope you join us for a new episode next week, and we'll see you then.